Hello, Alex. Hello, Noah. How is it going? Hi. Hey, thanks, thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you very much. It's a great honor for our conference, for all the team to have you on board this year. Uh, and before we start, I have one question for both of you. Is it's a question about naming. Probably Alex most subtly more, but Noah can join. So the question is, uh, how you know, how did you come up with a name for the company and for your product? <laughs> you know, honestly, it started as a um, as an Easter egg for for developers. So when we when we started the project. Um, we were building a storage engine with kernel bypass and the technology was kind of faceless in a way, right? It's very like hard to give a, a name. And so, um, so we picked Red Panda as an Easter egg and the company name was always, uh, was always vectorized, uh, you know, kind of, um, it was very modern. And so when, when we were actually looking at some point, we're like, okay, let's, renamed the product red panda has nothing to do with the with with what we do it has nothing to do with the storage engine it's just it, it's a cute pet right it's just it's a very uh cute pet and so um sorry cute animal and and so we sent a survey to like 80 developers uh just friends of friends and when we asked them hey can you pick one of these names and red panda was there honestly as an easter egg so we had things like whatever, vectorized instructions, like all of this stuff that was like cool and, and nerdy. And 80% of the people, they just loved the Red Panda. They thought it was it was cute and, and you know, personable and easy. And and I, it just picked up a brand on its own. And, and so it was just uh, it was just really funny, you know, because the, the company is all about real-time streaming, kernel bypass storage engine, like, you know, sort of mission critical stuff. And and Red Panda became this 8-bit art little pet that that uh, that we post on the website and people love it. And so um, that's that's how the name came to be. So, and very, I think, smart question from one of my colleagues is, do, does, your pro, does your product have a mascot? Yeah. <laughs> It, it has this um, this eight bit mascot. It actually took you know speaking of um, here here in your introduction about having multiple countries, uh, Red Panda the the design that you see on the website. <clears throat> so Red Panda is like a Firefox or like uh, whatever Fire Bear or something. There's like ten names all over the world for the same for the same animal, and um, and so we originally had the the design by a Colombian uh, design firm. And then we had a U.S. firm, and then we had a um, South uh, Southeast Asian firm, and then we brought it back to the U.S. again. And so it's been like it's been all over. It was a it, that design of the red panda that you see on the website, which looks a little bit like edgy and and um, like a bit inspired. Uh, took like four or five design firms all over the world, which was it's a cool note now that you speak about an international conference. Okay. So naming and design. Anyway, so we have a really technical conference and I'm pretty sure technical talk. So again, ladies and gentlemen, our heroes, uh, Mr. Uh, Noah Watkins and Mr. Alex Gachega. All right, let's, um, let's start. Um, I, I hope that you guys can see my, my, my presentation okay. Normally in person, it's really easy to judge uh, the, the feedback from, from the audience. So I'm gonna rely on Noah to kind of uh, field your questions. Feel free to, um, as we go through through the presentation, it's better if you just uh, type your questions to Noah, who's gonna be our EMC. Um, as, as you go through the questions, just make sure you have the right context, just ask it right away. Uh, I'll try to stop and, and pause. Um, we have an hour to, to go through this um, and that's, that's the best we could do in a virtual conference um, and uh, hope, hope to, to meet people in person soon. Um, but let's get started. So this talk is going to be pretty low level. Um, we, uh, we're gonna talk about some of the, the mechanical changes of, or to, to the classical raft implementation using a thread per core model for, for the Kafka API. <clears throat> and so, um, 
I was already introduced, but you can uh, uh, ask me any questions on Twitter after the talk. My my um, my handle is is available on on the slides. The what we're going to talk about today um, is really sort of the 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 practical implementation of what what happened in hardware over the last decade and how has that influenced the design and implementation of if you were to start from scratch today, what would you do differently? Uh, for if you were to let's say build a, a new storage engine and then you were to then add a Kafka API to that storage engine. So just to level set and, and make sure that, that we're sort of on the same page, um, I want to talk about how hardware is fundamentally different than it was a decade ago where the bottleneck, at least for a storage engine, was um, really saving data to disk, right? And so, so your disk were in the, sec in the millisecond uh, latency space. And now, with the rise of, of tall computers, it's really all about CPU coordination issues. Um, the the second one, the second observation is that um, everything is asynchronous now, and the new bottleneck is CPU, and so it sort of shifted the the bottleneck out of the spinning disk into, like I mentioned, CPU coordination. And so, if you were to start from scratch, what choices would, would you make uh, differently today? Um, and so the all of kind of this 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 observation as this conclusion is we'll walk you through actually the technical implementation of Red Panda, which at its core is really just a storage engine that we wrote um, from, from scratch, specially designed for 10 to 100x better tail latencies. Um, the source is available on GitHub too, so after the talk, feel free to um, you know, ch check it out and, and, and ask us questions. So let's get to let's let's get started, kind of on the on, on the observation and be more specific uh, here. Do we have um, uh, one of our advisors really loves to say sometimes you get to reinvent the wheel when the road changes. <laughs> so by that is the road being being hardware. So if we look at hardware a decade or so. Uh, ago, if you look at the latencies on an uh, on a spinning disk, um, you were in the milliseconds. So let's say like single digit millisecond to low double digit milliseconds to save a page to disk um, on 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 a spinning disk. And now, if you move into NVMe SSD devices, you're really about a thousand times uh, faster, right? So you're typically in the double digit microseconds or so uh, to to save a page uh, to to disk. But now, more fundamentally, uh, NVMe SSD devices are now 100x uh, cheaper than they were a decade ago. Um, and, uh, and so the, and then the second problem, the second sort of observation here is that now computers are 20 to 30 times taller. So on Google, you can go and rent a 225 uh, core, core machine. On, on Amazon, you have a 96 uh, core, core VM. And ARM is also going to change this, uh, you know, even farther going forward. Um, the next observation is that NICs that you're getting on the public clouds, like AWS, are reliable today. <laughs> For those of us that were doing cloud and were on Amazon over a decade ago, um, you know, I know they used to advertise like a gigabit per second, but when you were to try it, you really never got any, any of the promise. But now it is true. So if you rent any of the i3EN metal instances, you really do get sustained 100 gigabits per second, which is really um, amazing, uh, you know, see, seeing sort of the change in the last 10 years. So what does this mean, really? <clears throat> um, let's talk a little bit about the evolution of streaming and sort of uh, superimpose that on the evolutions, the mental models of, of software. So um, just for, for those of us that aren't experts in the streaming or haven't been paying attention um, on, on like what's happening in this particular sub area um, that is in databases is, is kind of like real time uh, eventing system. So prior to RabbitMQ, you had things like Solas and, and Tipco and all of these enterprise message buses. And what they did is that they would give you a physical hardware and then you would rack it in your data center. And that was roughly how the, the sales motion went. And so it was, it was expensive. It was honestly priced very odd in, in, in number of connections or throughput, uh, even though it was inside your data center, kind of like not, not very um, web, web friendly. Um, and so RabbitMQ came and 
and sort of made a huge dent and it really started to change the dynamics. And so there were really then two camps. There were the systems for which there was source code available on, on um, you know, now on GitHub uh, and, and those that, that were private. Now, uh, in 2010, Kafka came about and really brought some of the MapReduce style of thinking, which is like, how can we do streaming with cheap hardware? Uh, and so you have spinning disk, relatively cheap computers, and then you just make the software a little bit more scalable. In a similar fashion, how MapReduce changed uh, from you know, these big uh, mainframe uh, computers into, into, into chip computers. Um, so that was around 2010, 2011. Then Pulsar, Pulsar came about, and Pulsar's context is that it came out of Yahoo, where there were still, you know, they learned from the public clouds that you could disaggregate computer in the store and get higher uh, cost efficiencies by um, by effectively separating co computer and store. And by that, I mean the, the software that is doing the routing versus the software that is actually doing long-term retention of, of the data. Um, in, for those that didn't have large HDFS installations and so on, S3 or S3, which you know, later became an API, it was like first a system and then an API, um, actually became the true disaggregation of computer and store, evidenced by the Snowflake. So, um, and and then um, so it, let's let's do a quick superimpose of of the of the uh, uh, physical you know the platform right like software doesn't run on category theory it runs on this like super scalar uh, uh, CPUs with you know with uh, multi gigabyte per second channels to 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 the to the memory uh, subsystems and so this is kind of what we're seeing and so Red Panda is really coming at the tail end of this and we really learn from all of these systems, right? And we're not even taking into account the compute systems like uh, Spark and Storm, et cetera. This is really just the storage streaming subsystems. Um, and what we learned is that people love the Kafka API um, and, you know, but but we got a chance to, to start from scratch um, given the modern platform. So observation two is everything is really asynchronous uh, and CPU is the, new, is the new bottleneck. So to highlight that, uh, let's talk about this device on, on the right-hand side. So you have an NVMe, uh, Western Digital. It can take uh, 1.2 gigabytes per second, right? Um, and so it'll do at, at 3 gigahertz, let's say, 3 billion instructions per second. And I'm going to talk about a relatively, like, you know, moderately busy, but not super contented, um, right? Like, you, you haven't hit saturation on these NVMe SSDs. So to write a single page to disk, it's going to take uh, 20 to, to 140 microseconds. So the difference between um, doing a, a synchronous call, like doing um, F write basically, just to write to, to, the, to the file handle, um, and then let's say you were to print uh, a statement right below that, that function call, it would block anywhere from uh, 60 to 420 million clock cycles. Right, so you're just wasting that that um, um, <clears throat> that, that kind of compute power, um, right? Because you're not you're not doing anything; you're just simply kind of idling uh, right there. And so, in a storage system, then the question is like, how do we start to reason about this this wasted work, and can we take advantage of 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 this wasted work? Right? Like how do we leverage uh, this 420 million wasted clock cycles? So uh, Red Pan then, this is where I introduced sort of the, the threat per core model. And then the next uh, set of optimizations are really uh, sort of speaking about this, this observation in that uh, you know, CPU coordination is really the new bottleneck. And so a threat per core architecture sort of helps us um, do that. But then there's really two, two salient points. One is the architecture itself, and then second one is the asynchronicity model, right? So those are the, the, the two main observations. So uh, we use the library called CSTAR, and what it is, it's a, it's a pin thread per, per core, and in finance, people have been doing this since 2000, I don't know, since forever. I think since 2011, at least I know of five production systems in Wall Street when I used to work in New York, uh, of people that were doing this exact same architecture. Um, so, uh, so really, Sistar is this open source library that allows us to, to take advantage of it, but the model is, is relatively well tested and battle tested for low latency systems. And you can think of Red Panda as sort of this combination 
of taking some of the ideas from from like you know this this low latency training systems to a large extent that are now possible because of the increase in core counts and sort of the shift in in, in bottleneck in compute to CPU coordination, um, and then you know sort of uh, leveraging the the low latency system with with sort of a, a system catered for big data, which is sort of the Kafka API. So, anyways, so um, let's let's talk about the Threadripper core model uh, real quick. What happens is. You, you start up your computer, and let's say, in, in this case, you have this very odd computer of, with, with three cores. Um, and so uh, if you look at the memory, you, you start up the, the program, and then the, the memory gets split evenly across all of the cores. And every core is fundamentally a p-thread. But that p-thread is pinned. It means it doesn't, it doesn't uh, jump around, right? So um, it, it's pinned to that particular core, and, and this is why I make it a thread per core architecture which allows you to have a lot of um, uh, low latency kind of memory access because it's locked to that particular thread um, and so on. It doesn't jump around the cache lines. There's no you know, moving the state from one, from one uh, uh, physical core into a different physical core for that particular P thread and so on. But the fundamental um, uh, architecture here is that when you start to move to a thread per core architecture, then you have to reason about the synchronization primitives. Like at some point, you're going to have to send messages between core zero and core one, or core one and core two, and so on. Um, and so uh, there is no uh, panacea, and 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 this is really um, uh, a burden on on the programmer. <laughs> in that um, it's really a lot of work to ensure that all of your interfaces are, are asynchronous. And, and in fact, when we started Red Panda, the reason it took us so long, I think we spent something like two years just writing code, uh, as in like with very little customers, just very early, just prototype uh, customers that were just testing out the, the product, is because we literally had to write everything. So we wrote our own networking library, uh, clearly this is our own threading library, our own raft protocol, our own serialization protocol. Um, simply because your threading model is fundamentally attached to your I/O model, um, and then you then also attach your your uh, memory model and like your synchronization primitives. Um, so, asynchronicity first uh, with a comparative scheduling. When you start to have this particular uh, thread pin, pin thread per course, you need something else. Uh, it, it is not enough to to just have works and 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 let's say like NQ a, a struct of a, of a task that has like this is a pointer to some function and and I'm just going to start to execute those functions. You need a wrapper that allows you to add priorities, whether it's an I/O priority or it's a CPU priority or it's a cross network priority, or you're switching between core zero and core two a lot and you need to throttle that. With asynchronicity, it means there's no real back pressure, right? And, and so you often have to re-architect your, your, your software so that you don't boom all the time, right? Like the, the nice thing about asynchronous programming is that there's this built-in back pressure and buffering, right? Like you're, you're right, and then you know that now after the, the right function call, uh, the memory has been uh, freed, right? Like you, you write it and you put it in a, in, a, in a scope. And so when when that function returns, you know that now you have that memory available and so on. But when it's asynchronous, right? Like you need some coordination mechanism or you need some throttling uh, mechanism to understand uh, when memory is being freed and, and, you know, just how to reason actually exactly about back pressure. And that's where the a future, which is just a struct wrapper around that, really com comes into play as a viral primitive. And if you've programmed in Akka uh, or, or Pony, the language, or if you use other actor frameworks like Orleans in, in the C-sharp world, um, what is nice about a future and, and all of these asynchronous frameworks is that you know, it's true that they are viral, as in it's actually easier to embrace asynchronicity uh, and, and, and comparative scheduling as, a, as you're writing the program because it gives you a sound concurrency model. So you end up programming to a correct uh, uh, concurrency and parallelism model um, uh, rather than, than you know, later on having to figure out your, your locking semantics. What does that mean? You know that on a thread per core model, your parallelism 
is fixed to the number of physical threats that you give, you know, in this case, Red Panda to start, right? Like you give your program, say uh, three, three cores. That's, that's the number of simultaneous possible execution. There can't be no more than that, full stop. But you write your code in a concurrent structure uh, through, through these futures. And you let the parallelism be a runtime variable. And so it's really all about program structure. And that's what a future allows you to do. So it allows you to have a sound model about your, your program structure. And you use explicit uh, message passing between cores. So once you land on a particular core, sort of the future abstraction and future scheduler takes over. And when you need to cross core boundaries, the future is also like a nice gluing abstraction that you don't know when that's going to, to finish. But what you know is that in the future, it might get fulfilled and or you know uh, set, and, and, and then you can continue the execution. So anyways, so you need, you need a wrapper structure, whether you call it future or task or uh, whatever. There's like 100 names for, for this kind of parallelism. But this is the mental model that we'll, that we'll go over. All right. We're largely going to go over uh, nine techniques, and um, we need to start to speed up some of the the, uh, the technical uh, track here. Um, so please ask questions in line. Anyways, the one of the and, and so the, the goal is that at the end of these nine nine techniques, um, this, these are the techniques of how we went about achieving actually ten to hundred x better T latencies. One of them is we use no virtual memory, and so we pre-allocate hundred percent of the memory. And then we split it across cores. So uh, you saw the picture on the thread per core model where we had three cores, and then you know you kind of chunk in your memory into n n n stages. Um, Sistar in, inside the, the library uses a body allocator, and so what it is a body allocator. It's it's this very uh, simple uh, allocator um, and. But it's really difficult for the developer to reason about it in practice. And so what it is is, is you, you take your full arena, you split it per core, and then every core now has, let's say, two gigabytes of memory, right? And that is it. It means if your program allocate has like a payload that is larger than, than the memory, since we don't use any virtual memory, you'll simply boom uh, the, the, the machine. So imagine this scenario where you actually have 64 core, 64 gigabytes of memory. Uh, in, in a single computer, you can't ever make an allocation bigger than whatever is allocated to the core. And in fact, it oftentimes is like much less, right? It's often like 30% or something like that. So this works really well for, for the Kafka API. And, and so this wouldn't be a general framework for all, all compute. I know there are some scientific workloads where <laughs> you just allocate like 64 gigabytes of memory as a single byte array, and, and then you start to manipulate on that. Um, uh, so, so it's a, it doesn't fit all, all use cases, but it gives you low latency memory access and memory allocation, right? And so you have this thread local memory arena, which is let's usually say it's, it's two gigabytes of memory. Um, and the way the body allocator works is that every time it needs memory, it goes into the parent pool, uh, into the body pool, and it splits the body and it says, okay, I'm gonna take half of the memory um, of this, and then I'm gonna create a pool of this. Of you know memory memory divided by two chunk, um, and so what this forces the developer to do is that actually every data structure that you write, you always have to think about what is the memory pressure. One example here that is very, I think, um, fundamental and, and and it may sound trivial is that our hash tables are we pay a ton of attention during code reviews as like what type of of hash table you're using. So uh, uh, Google has a really good library called AppSale, uh, which is a C++ library that has very low latency uh, hash table lookups, I think often to, to, uh, to memory access, um, just to get access to, to the actual um, item in memory. The problem with that is that if that hash table were to grow, um, the growing factor now has, you know, has a limit. And so what we found is that in practice, Actually, just growing a simple hash table uh, has fundamental performance issues uh, when you've been running the, pro the program for, let's say, like a month uh, or so. So you start to see a lot of memory fragmentations and so on. Um, so, so this is really the, the kind of the first technique. Now, there's a second technique for a throw per chord architecture, which we called um, IO buff, and it's similar to the kernel uh, K buff in, in the Linux kernel. 
And in, um, in the FreeBSD kernel, it's called mbuf. Uh, and what we did is, uh, so, so the fragmented technique are, are the, the techniques I mentioned. Actually, every networking appliance I can actually think of uses this, this exact technique. And so what happens is when you're sending data over the network, it never comes as a one gigabyte chunk. It just doesn't happen. It comes in this like randomly sized chunks and, and it's affected by all sorts of things like networking gear in the middle and so on, right? So you just get a TCP stream of chunks. It's kind of really how it happens. But you need to overlay uh, application semantics over a bunch of discretized chunks. And so in this example, let's say we were reading 265 kilobytes uh, of memory for a particular request. Um, and and, and then and you're going to do a, a jump in a core. So you're going to receive this on core zero, uh, and sorry, on core one, but you're going to send it to core zero as the, as the destination core. And so I above, it's a fragmented buffer, but we've implemented an iterator model on top of this fragmented buffer. So, uh, so it really deals with like, you know, the boundary conditions. What happens when you're crossing uh, a, a chunk boundary between the first 128 kilobytes and the two kilobytes? This has a fundamental impact when you don't have virtual memory. And the idea here is that um, because you don't have virtual memory, you're going to experience as a function of the program runtime memory fragmentation. And, uh, and this I above was actually a technique um, that if you have virtual memory, it's really less of an issue. Uh, but if you don't have virtual memory, it's like there's no other way to get around the memory fragmentation. You're either going to stop the program, compact your memory, move your memory arenas to a different thing, or you're going to try and exploit the fact that you don't have that, and then you're just trying to find the next best chunk. And so this is what I above is all about, is understanding that we don't have virtual memory, and, and over time, you're going to have massive memory fragmentation. And so it's like, how do we keep this low latency buffer management in a way that allows us to delete and, and do correct memory accounting. And so the last part of I above, which is critical to a third per core architecture, is um, uh, memory accounting, right? So if you allocate, remember that each core has a two gigabyte often uh, limit. And so if you allocate on core zero, but the destination core, i.e. the core that is actually going to do useful work with this chunk is on core one, you need a way to route messages back to core zero to say, hey, core zero, please the allocate some memory. Um, and this is the original pointer, and this is the original size. And so I above is really just this interface that it looks like, like a buffer. You know, it looks like a vector if you're using C to a large extent. You just add chunks and remove chunks. And behind the scenes, it does all of this correct memory accounting. Um, and this is really the workforce of, of, uh, of Red Panda. Um, all right. The second performance Alex. technique for it, yeah. Alex, I want to jump in with a question real quick. <clears throat> this is um, this is crazy. So there's there's no support from the kernel for allocating larger contiguous regions when the application needs it, and you're dividing the memory up between the cores. D does the application developer have to like manage this at all? Like, if I'm sending a message to another core, do I have to track? that allocation manually? Or like, what, what is the burden on the developer when they're writing software like this? Yeah, so um, by now, I think it's pretty, um, th there isn't much. But when we started writing Red Panda, it's really onerous. Uh, <laughs> and so that's why I mentioned on, on like, it, it, you know, I basically think we need better frameworks. So an I above, it's sort of this, uh, it coalesces all of these ideas around correct memory accounting. Um, but it, it is true that if, if you are using a thread per core model and you're using thread local allocations, um, like there's no getting around it. The, the core that allocated the memory has to be the core that deletes the memory, right? Like that, that's just how completeness of the, of the memory accounting works. And what IOBUFF gives you is it's just a wrapper, right? And so I think that by and large, most programmers that hack on Red Panda never see this abstraction. They see this I above abstraction, um, and and you know it just works. Um, but but sometimes you do have to realize that you are copying memory or that you are accessing this. And so in debug mode, we have a large set of assertions that will just crash your program if you happen to access a core 
So memory to, if you want to mutate memory that, that doesn't belong to your core. And so, you know, so it's really all about, there, there's, you know, I don't have a good answer for that other than, than by and large, most developers don't deal with this. Um, and, and you're in debug mode, uh, they, um, there's a large set of assertions to make sure that you're never mutating memory that doesn't belong to you. And so it's just like a set of utility libraries that we've built over time. It's fun. So it's fundamentally complicated, but the wins are the performance wins are worth it. Totally. Um, okay. Technique three. Uh, no, how are we tracking on time? Do we have like a forty minutes left, or? That's right. Okay. So out of order rights. Uh, this is another significant, and <laughs> I think that by the end of this, you'll realize how closely similar uh, is to write a storage engine as it is to write an operating system. Um, it's like, to a large extent, we've, we've, we've taken the uh, sort of this application-specific knowledge and, and almost built an operating system on top of, a, of an operating system. So out of order direct memory access rights. Um, this is critical for uh, throughput. Um, and actually, overall, it, 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 in aggregate, it reduces latencies. So what it is is that the so, so Red Panda aligns the memory boundaries to what the hardware tells you, right? So when you start up the program, we ask the file system, hey, file system, give me your memory boundary, uh, sorry, your your um, your memory alignment, and it'll tell you it's 512 bytes. Um, I think you can always assume 4096 is a safe boundary. There's like a lot of hard-coded uh, things in the Linux kernel where 4096 is a magic number. But anyways, uh, sometimes it's, it's a four kilobyte page, sometimes a two megabyte page if you enable huge pages, et cetera. And so you ask the file system, hey, give me, give me your, your, uh, your memory alignment, and then it'll give me your alignment. And what it means is that you can simply send a pointer that is uh, that is memory aligned to what the hardware is expecting. And so, when when you're writing um, your your futures, you don't necessarily have to uh, you know write write them in order because you've mapped the address space of your memory to a particular address space of your file system. You can simply dispatch them in parallel. Um, and so this has a lot of, um, you know, th this image is basically does, does justice to that in that, you know, often you will dispatch it in, in, in this particular case, you will dispatch uh, one, two, three, four, but in the way this image shows is you're going to get back acknowledgement from the files from the, you know, ultimately the NVMe SSD device in uh, four, one, two, three order. Um, and that And that's okay, right? Like you're just basically... Uh, guaranteeing correctness of layout on the application space, and then just letting hardware execute, and 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 you'll reap the benefits either with IOU ring, as in like later you'll rip 128 of these events per core, or with uh, lib AIO you'll rip uh, you know say a, a bunch of them at a time, 20 or or 50. I think there's a limit of 128 um, uh, IO um, IOCBs that you can rip at any one time. Um, and so, anyways, so so this is actually critical to improving throughput, um, and and it's it's really just a technique for for all uh, storage engines that are that are doing um, uh, low latency stuff. Okay, the next technique is no page cache. Um, why is this the case? This is a uh, very contentious uh, for for <laughs> for some reason, um, but uh, but but our claim is this: um, the Linux kernel page cache introduces non-determinism in the IO path, uh, for full stop, right? And, and, and let me give you the, the reasons why, right? So the page cache is actually a global object per, per file. So when you open up a file in the kernel, it instantiates a page cache for that file. And that page cache has to be a global uh, object for lots of, 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 of synchronicity uh, issues. And, and, and one of them, sorry, coherency issues, and one of those is that you may write to the file, but then you may read from a different thread, and you kind of expect the kernel to do the right thing and guess what you're thinking. And when you read on, and when you read from this particular file, you're sort of expecting it to be fast. And so what it is is the Linux schedule is this, you know, it, it's it's never a bad choice. Uh, full stop. Right? Like if you use the page cache, it's never really a bad choice, but it's not always a good choice. And so the reason is that it always tries to be a middle ground. Um, one particular technique that it uses is its read-ahead strategies. 
and I know you can you can took this too, which which is like the, the idea is that let's say that you wanted to read in the middle of a file, and so you'll stick to the file and then you'll read around that particular page, right? And so the reason for that is most people on most operating systems for most applications will read big chunks. So what can the kernel do for you is it'll jump to that particular page and it'll do what it's called the read ahead. And so it'll actually start to prefetch the hardware and say, hey, hardware, give me the next four or five pages just because I know this user is very likely to give me this particular stuff. Sometimes that's not the case. <laughs> you know, for, for us, we know exactly how much to read at what times at what boundaries. And so if you look on the right, um, what the Kafka API gives us is a lot of, of uh, uh, um, uh, metadata uh, about exactly the, the, the length, uh, the, the offsets, um, you know, the timestamp, all of these attributes that allows us to make pretty intelligent uh, decisions about how much to read or when not to read or when to cache or when not to cache. And it may sound trivial um, on, on a single file, but remember that what we're trying to do is do this for, you know, a, a real-time sort of big data system. And, and so all of this small optimi seemingly small optimizations have a huge uh, payout impact. And, and uh, you know, th there's one that, that I want to highlight here too, which is when you're using the page cache, you have this hard to understand failure semantics. And it goes around, it's, the, it's, you know, it's this idea that if you're not managing the code that actually writes to the hardware, somebody else is writing the code and, and it's somebody else's bugs and errors and problems. And they're really hard to diagnose. And sometimes it actually leads to uh, hard to track correctness bugs. The, in this presentation, you will see a link to the Postgres bug where there was a, um, actually a data, um, data loss issue that was inside Postgres for 20 years. And so, uh, and, and so it, is, it was a strategic decision and it was an explicit choice to not use the page cache and instead to use our domain knowledge, right? So the Kafka API says, hey, I want to read a megabyte. And this is almost true for all Kafka workloads is you always read ahead, right? It's, it's like you find the pointer and you always read ahead, except you're doing indexing and other manipulation. And so it's kind of, being able to embed this domain knowledge and these exception rules uh, into this, this storage system. And now what that means for us is that our thread local cache is not per object, but is per, per core. So we have limited memory. And so instead of having a, a cache per, per, per file object, we have a cache per core. And the cache is actually a fully materialized, ready to be shipped to the wire cache. And so when the next request comes in, we're just like piping the bytes as fast as we can into the network uh, without any translations. And so, uh, yeah, and, and so we can also try to understand and have totally different strategies in the same way that a database will do a plan and execution phase. We actually just added another plan and execution phase just for the read ahead algorithm. It's like, what is this particular TCP connection in relation with the other workload that this particular core is handling and how do we leverage that? And, and how do we have a balance between uh, you know, making sure that we fit this really uh, hungry TCP connection for data versus other, you know, workloads that we're doing in, in, in the foreground. All right, let's take a second here. Uh, adaptive allocation is perhaps the easiest thing that you could do to your application to gain about 20% uh, of latency improvement. <laughs> uh, it's su such an easy trick. You basically call uh, file locate on, on, on the file handle and then you, you end up getting all sorts of goodies. It does, um, uh, it does have an issue with, uh, with your recovery. So it's, it's not, it, it doesn't come without downsides. Um, but okay, what is adaptive allocation? It means that every time you're changing the, the metadata of the inode, right? It, it, is, it is a global operation, uh, right? Because there's a lot of things that need to be updated. Sometimes the folder size needs to be updated, right? So like if you're writing a file to a particular folder path and that folder metadata needs to be updated and there's all sorts of, file system intrinsics about when that metadata gets, gets broadcasted globally to all of the cores and you have to introduce a barrier in the kernel, et cetera. Um, and so the way to reduce metadata contention, so instead of updating the file and the timestamp every time you write, you defer, you make your recovery logic a little bit more complicated 
but you pre-allocate a big chunk so that there is uh, less metadata contention. And, and so this is what file location is about. It's a, it's a very easy uh, uh, system call to, to, plan, to, to, to add to your application. And as long as you have checksum in, uh, then, then you should be okay, right? Like the, you have to embed additional application specific knowledge and you have to understand that when you crash, and you haven't truncated to the last actual known good offset, or you haven't f-sync to, to the file system, and you haven't done like all of the correct cleanup procedures, you have to reread the file, the last, the last, uh, all, all of the active last file segments, and and recover them. And so you know, so it's a little bit more complicated um, uh, to do, but that is very easy to to unit test uh, uh, in practice. So. I, if this is probably one of the lowest hanging fruits that you can implement in, in your application if you're doing storage. Um, all right, Raft, read ahead, and, and, and operation coalescing. Um, Raft is, is it's, uh, it's our replication protocol. Um, and uh, w what it is, it's a, it's a, it, it's a quorum system. Um, and so it, it, the way it guarantees data safety is it, sends data to majority and you have this mathematical proof. And the proof says you can survive F failures given two F plus one nodes. In layman's term, it means as long as 50% plus one uh, number of nodes are, are, um, have, have the data, um, then, 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 then you should be okay to survive, uh, you know, uh, some, some like F failures given two F plus one nodes. So or n over two failures, um, and so, so 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 that's Raft as as, as a protocol, and and uh, th the question is like how do we go about making Raft fast? <laughs> so Raft is is uh, intrinsically a a system that introduces barriers not just uh, on every write uh, right because it it needs to have it's basically a sequencing protocol. It, it says like. If this write finished, then you're always going to be able to read this write, and then it also says this write and this write. Uh, sorry, um, a write happened before this other write, and so on. Um, and so, how do we go about talking about the mechanical execution uh, of this? Just to stay technical about how do we make the system fast uh, in 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 the low latency space. So, if you look on the graph above, uh, graph will will have this this appends, and so we have operations labeled uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. And so often what you get is you do a write, a flush, a write, a flush, a write, and a flush, right? And so you have three, three raft appends, and they translate to six uh, syscalls, uh, right? Like you, you, you have to write the data and so on. So what we do is remember that you have multiple TCP connections uh, right, right into this particular uh, 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 file system. And, and right click. Like disk is a shared uh, is is basically it's a shared resource, and so from a protocol level, it'll we have to we have to keep it correct. But when we get to the disk level, is how do we start to optimize things? And so one way is we do what what effectively CPUs have done for a really long time, uh, which is read ahead of operation dispatch. And so uh, we'll we'll debounce, and so it's an artificial uh, latency of say of four four milliseconds. Um, and, and this is tunable. And, and so uh, now that you have these three operations, then you'll do a translation. What does this operation mean into the physical space, right? Like it, it, it has to save data onto a physical device. That, that's the whole point of a storage engine is to take whatever <laughs> you're telling it and save it into a physical medium. It's basically the gist of what this thing has to do. And so um, what we do is that then we'll dispatch, uh, we'll realize that, hey, there is an operation that requires a flush. In fact, there are three operations that require a flush. So what we're going to do is we can't uh, we can't change the semantics because that would violate all the protocols and, and and nobody could make sense of the data. But what we can do is we'll um, we'll we'll sequence the right such that uh, the the final the the user observable effect is the same, but the mechanical execution is different. And so, if uh, you've taken a concurrency class, you know it's you know it's kind of the classic like as long as this or this is the same as this, uh, we're free to do whatever we we want. Um, uh, so Joel Wine, who who worked on some of the earlier TCP protocols, that's how I understand concurrency. Anyways, so we'll dispatch the the writes, uh, and so we'll dispatch operations one, three, and five. We'll skip the next two flushes because we know uh, there's a flush at the end of this group commit. 
um, and then we'll flash at the end, and then we'll acknowledge this this three particular uh, raft appends that may be part of different raft groups, etc. But on the disk level, uh, we do, uh, you know, we'll issue three writes, uh, and then we'll flush uh, as, as as a group. And and this has about twenty percent uh, less less uh, operations in this particular scenario, and then this sort of scales really well. So as you start to hit saturate. So, it, what is interesting about this operation is that it doesn't show up unless you're hitting hardware saturation. <laughs> and then you hit our hardware saturation and then your latencies are all over the place. So this is really an optimization on the tail end on uh, trying to just extract uh, performance out of that. Um, okay, request pipelining. So we are, so, so this is uh, the same three core weird machine uh, uh, model. And, and, and so you have core zero, one, and two. Um, fundamentally, uh, we uh, we use a, a, a network of SPMC, uh, so single producer, single consumer uh, queues, um, lock, lock free queues to to send messages across uh, all of the cores. And and the reason for that is that we want to invalidate particular cache lines. Uh, we don't want to send like a global barrier and so on. Um, and so what has been uh, super important is actually to understand how to pipeline the 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 writes. And pipelining is is uh, is this kind of effect. And instead of sending uh, one message to to partition zero, waiting for the writes to finish, coming back to to the source core, and then sending the next write, what we do is we start to simply send uh, a, a bunch of writes, and then at some point when we've detected a particular level of saturation, we'll block the 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 TCP connection. We'll actually propagate back pressure to the TCP connection. But in the meantime, it allows us to start to saturate disk. Um, and that has been, all of these techniques are for, for, for the new hardware, right? And so basically, I guess a big takeaway to tie to the original part of the presentation is that when you're modeling your software construction for a particular hardware, it, when the hardware changes, like you have to fundamentally model it differently. And so this is one way in which is modeled fundamentally different, right? So we've talked about no virtual memory, uh, IOBA, file location, and some of those are still applicable to the older uh, way of, of constructing software. Um, but but this request pipelining truly is uh, a fit for, for a Threadper core model. And yeah, let's see what else is interesting here. And so um, what you do, which is uh, perhaps uh, the, the most interesting is that um, you have to be able to piggyback metadata on, on your way back uh, in a second. And so just to walk over this particular graph, you have a bunch of Kafka clients, and that TCP connection happens to be handled, in this case, by core zero. Any core could handle it. As you see, they are identical uh, mirror images of, of, of each other because, like I mentioned on the slide, like three or four, it's all about building software for sorry, having the correct software construction model and uh, building for concurrency and allowing parallelism to be a free runtime variable. And so in this particular case, you have Kafka clients connecting to core zero. Um, and so you, you get through the RPC, you decode the requests, you reserve some memory units, uh, then it goes into the Kafka handler. It goes into a partition router, which says, you know, like correct validation of the core, then it goes into raft. And so, <clears throat> um, uh, and, and so, sorry. So then in, in this case, it'll actually go into uh, core, it'll go into a network of SPNC queues. Um, at some point it gets picked up by the loop on core one, because remember every core has a particular loop, uh, but it obviously it skips the RPC and Kafka handler and it goes straight into the raft subsystem, which then uh, writes to the storage subsystem, and then there's a similar round trip all the way back to, to core zero. So now imagine you have uh, 10 Kafka clients, and, 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 and every core is sending uh, every other core, right? So core zero and core, core two are sending all of their traffic to core one as a mental example. Um, this is when it really starts to pay off, right? As soon as, like, you know, the, the designing for, for latency, it, it's kind of interesting because we're trying to balance latency with throughput. And oftentimes, uh, to get the best latency, then, then you block for one request. But obviously, you don't want to pay $1,000 a month on some expensive hardware on the cloud if you're only going to send a one request per second. That doesn't make any sense. 
it is an okay trade-off if you're doing low latency systems like like uh, for, for, for trading, where really one trade makes you all of the money for the year. But for most people in the big data is you're really trying to balance like how do we get the latency as low as possible while still saturating the hardware? I think it's a different design space fundamentally. Uh, and this is what 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 Red Panda uh, optimizes for. Um, now uh, this is a this is a similar image uh, in in a, kind of a different context here, and the the next technique for 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 a throw per chord architecture. Uh, <laughs> um, it's funny because I wrote panda 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 backing instead of piggybacking. Um, is called uh, core local uh, metadata piggybacking. So, <clears throat> uh, one second, let me get a drink of water. When you're dispatching um, cores, uh, sorry, when you're dispatching requests to remote cores, there's always going to be a coherency issue. And this is true for all Threadper core models. And so it is not a fit for a lot of users. Uh, I just kind of want to highlight that. Uh, when it is a fit, it really does give you kind of a bunch of benefits, uh, mostly the, the benefit of, of writing to an explicit parallelism and concurrency model. That's really the main benefit. But anyways, uh, and, and, and that you can take advantage of tall hardware. Um, so, uh, so, so, so this, this thread local model uh, says any particular core is never going to have a global view. But like, by design, what we have done is we've split up the world into n number of cores. And so every core is always going to have a stale and, and, and partial view of the metadata. And so let me give you one example. Let's say you had a table of users. And your job on a thread record architecture is to validate, is this user still an authenticated user? Right? <clears throat> and so typically what you do is you figure out a way to shard uh, users to particular cores in, in some capacity. There's a many sharding algorithms. But now uh, what you do is you split up the problem um, uh, into, into n, n cores, or um, you can still have lazy materialization of all of the users per core. Those are your really options, right? Either every core keeps a copy of the entire metadata, or uh, every core is sharded, and you always jump around uh, for for to, to, to the right destination core. So in our case, the metadata cache and partition router and, and TCP back pressure, et cetera, uh, is actually copied around every core, but the data is obviously not copied around every core. This would be like, <laughs> it would be silly. It would just be, we just, just have one core. And so um, you really do make that decision on, on the latency and throughput profile and metadata trade-off that you want to have with your application. But one particularly useful technique, and, and the point of this slide, um, is metadata piggybacking. And so for us, when we parse a, a Kafka TCP connection and we decode it, we hydrate it into a memory object, uh, and now we can act on that particular memory object. Um, when we send the request to, to, to core one in this particular example, so in this example, core zero parse the request, and core one is going to save data on, on disk. And so uh, what, uh, what, what this is saying is, after you save data to disk, I want you to tell me information, right? Here's the kind of useful uh, information. What is the latency the disk is, is experiencing for that particular core? And the reason that's useful is sometimes you have this, this hot spotting. And you really have to start to build in back pressure at every core for this because you don't understand which not not only which machine but also which core within each machine is is hot spotted right like overall you might have actually a totally balanced network throughput but on any particular machine it may happen that core one has 30 percent of the traffic right uh, or something like that and we have uh, mitigation techniques for this inside red panda uh, which, which actually just landed this week we are, we, we can migrate uh, cores to non-busy cores etc but anyways um what this allows you, this technique says, on your way back, try to add as much metadata, right? So, so latency profiles of your disk, uh, saturation profiles, how many number of partition, has there been any offset changes? And so offsets are useful for our read ahead strategies on the source core. And so this is really um, an underrated technique in the, in the Thropper core uh, model that I wish I, I had known about this uh, uh, a long time ago, but, but uh, yeah, so 
think of it as a as a void pointer, and then you just attach a struct uh, that you know that is read only memory, and you know you copy a few integers, but it's really kind of improves the metadata management uh, and, and, and partial view visibility. So over time, you never actually have a correct picture, but you have a pretty close to a correct picture on, on every core. And honestly, that's good enough. Like you never really need to understand, mo most of the time there are, there are, there are obviously things that, that you do need to have a correct answer for. But for the Kafka model, right? let's say that you are reading data uh, oh, should I need to move to the next slide? Uh, you're reading data uh, for for a particular file or a particular partition uh, on topic. Like, what you really need to know is like, should I be able to dispatch an, an uh, aggressive read ahead strategy for a disk, or do I just lazily materialize the next request, right? And and so there's some problems for which piggybacking is really the, the perfect solution. We have been sprinting over a set of, of very low level technical. Um, uh, <laughs> techniques and, and this is the last one. So if you have questions, uh, definitely let us know um, here. So this this technique uh, it's called a two-phase plus trigger cross-core write request splitting. Uh, this is a mouthful, and we're going to walk through this uh, very very um, uh, slowly. This technique for some particular uh, saturate hardware profile saturation uh, was able to give us over 10x uh, performance improvement over the previous Red Panda. And so remember that what we're trying to do is how do we give users the best latency possible while still being able to drive hardware at throughput saturation? So, so that's the goal. And uh, let me describe the, the two stages uh, and then the trigger, I'm going to skip it because the, the main two things is the stages. So the first stage is that the source core parses the, uh, the request and then it says, I am not the owner of this particular request. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to dispatch it to, uh, to, to disk. Now here's, here's where the trigger comes in. The trigger says, so, so let's walk from, from, uh, from uh, top to bottom, so that's uh, on the left in, on a timeline. And so you read the request, you parse the request, you say it's not for this core, you, you post it to the destination core, you replicate it and you sequence it. This is the first fundamental um, divorce on, and I think innovation here. And so once it's been sequenced, aka it's been you know entered into the disk buffer, it hasn't been it hasn't been acknowledged or written. It's just been sequenced. Then you immediately tell the the source code, hey, go back and do something more useful. Um, and and this is critical uh, because it allows us, especially for the Kafka RPC model, uh, it allows us to start to decode and allocate memory uh, for the next request. And, and decoding and checksumming and CPU and all of that, just honestly, it takes time. And so uh, so this was really, really important to, to tell the next core, hey, to, to start doing that. And oftentimes, this is, we're trading like uh, a couple of you know nanoseconds, which is like the thing that is gonna post to the originating core, often for microseconds, right? And so the, the microsecond is how long it's going to check to, to, um, uh, to, to checksum and, and, and decode. And so and then the second phase starts. And so the second phase does the same thing. It parses the code, it decodes it, it checks some, it posts it into the destination core, and asks for the core. Now at this time, the first write finished, and so we send. This is the second phase, which is we then uh, send the data to um, to uh, uh, um, to the originating core, and then we also saw that we have the second uh, phase, the second for the second request that you started decoding, also finished. In the underlying execution on disk, this is where debouncing, batching, and pipelining really kind of ties in to get the full strategy, right? So what we've done here is we went over the techniques on starting on the core, building on the memory pressure, building on I above, building on um, uh, you know then then request pipelining, building on the raft structure, and now we're all the way now to the Kafka layer which is like, how do we keep exploiting the concurrency and parallelism to, to really just lower the latency while being able to saturate the hardware? Um, and yeah, so, so this really had a, a fantastic and, and really large improvement. This is going to be released next week. Uh, so 
Uh, this is actually just in, in the dev branch. Uh, it just landed. Um, Noah, who's our EMC, uh, was, was a big author of this particular feature. Um, so uh, I think that's basically it. We're at the top of the hour. We're actually a minute over. Um, I invite you to check out the, this is all on GitHub. Um, and then uh, feel free to log into our Slack and ask us questions or say hi on Twitter. I'll stop here and, and uh, wait, wait for questions. Uh, Noah? Great. That was a, <clears throat> that was a fantastic talk. Alex, thank you. <clears throat> um, I think if anyone has any questions, please uh, post those into the Telegram chat. Um, and I have some questions too while we're waiting on questions from the audience. Yes, it's 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 a time to ask questions, correct? Uh, first, probably, I'm not sure the audience is very active because this is the fourth day of the conference. I think it's a very long conference probably, but we have a lot of speakers from the US and that's why we have to like uh, move uh, the the conference itself to the you know evenings uh, uh, in Europe time and the first question from my side Alex if you don't mind uh, sure, go the, for it. yes yes thank you the question is uh, so during the talk uh, you described a lot of interesting techniques solutions and principles and which one you can call as common practice or patterns, uh, which ones you can call some like tricks, uh, and which ones you can call probably unexpected insights or innovations from your point of view? Yeah, so patterns, I would say um, this is the core. So, is, sorry, uh, sorry, is small, small, one small thing for our team. Yes, please show the slides. Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, the, the Thropper core is really uh, a fundamental pattern. Um, asynchronicity is really, really a big pattern. Um, I think that, you know, it doesn't matter whether you're using futures or actors or something, but, but having a sound concurrency model, and honestly, you're almost forced into this. This is like a code design. You don't really have to, but, but often people will pair a Thrupper core model with either an actor model or, or, or a future model, which you can actually model both at the same time. Um, you know, uh, tricks is definitely no virtual memory, that there's no reason why you, this is really kind of if you're trying to optimize, same thing with IOBOB and, and all of this stuff. And then the last one is the unexpected um, uh, things uh, are really kind of the, the last two, sorry, this, uh, the pipelining read ahead operation dispatch on raft. We honestly didn't expect this much of a savings. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's just when we implemented this, we're just wowed uh, at, at kind of the performance improvement. I mean, in retrospect, it's obvious, but when you're writing the code, you're just like, eh, I don't know, is this going to work? Um, then, then the second one is uh, this core local uh, metadata piggybacking. It solved so many problems. Um, that for us in terms of metadata updates and trying to keep a global view, this is, I don't know, if, if I wish I had known about, and, and all of this is obvious, like the, the thing about system design is like after you implement it and you understand all of this, uh, then, then, then it's obvious. But when we were writing the system, we really struggled with, with metadata for, for honestly for a couple of years. Um, this uh, and then the last one, uh, so it's sort of as another unexpected case is, and I think what where we are right now is that we're starting to get to the edge of, you know, sort of the low hanging fruit, and we, you know, so sort of the techniques like this particular technique landed last week. We're now more on like the the you know optimizing edge cases, uh, and so this is kind of where where some of our techniques are becoming more sophisticated. Does that make sense? Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Like, like uh, you have a classification. Good. Thank you very much. And uh, <laughs> like uh, Noah, we have some questions in the chat. Sure. Yeah. Um, let's see. It looks like a uh, first question is uh, Alex. So, do you target any specific CPU or specific architecture for this? It's pretty low level, so we could imagine there's some CPU features that you rely on. Uh, yeah, let me let me count the way. I, um, let me let me try to see. So we work on x86 on ARM. Um, it basically is the gist. Um, and uh, we moved away. We had uh, more more techniques um, like 
We had pointer tagging techniques uh, that allowed us to, to do uh, basically inline metadata extraction, like size, pointer, garbage collection, et cetera. Um, but that only lasted so far because I think the Linux kernel went from uh, a 56-bit pointer to a 48-bit pointer. And now I think on ARM, it's only like a 38-bit pointer. And so we start to lose bits. And so we had to like, you know, use, use different Lucasi data structures. Um, so the short answer is we were, we were more architecture specific, uh, but we've had to remove that code as, as we started to lose bits on, 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 on the pointer size and, and, and that kind of stuff. Um, so I would say right now there's very few things that are really architecture specific and, and those that are like UTFA encoding and decoding are decided at compile time. And so we have a bunch of assembly for like UTFA decoding is a really good example or uh, you know validation of the strings. And so we'll just link the correct library depending on the architecture. Um, and you know they're all available and they're open source libraries. It's just a matter of triggering the right optimization flags for, and so our build system is large and sophisticated and we compile the compilers. So we, we use Clang head mostly, uh, uh, so like the latest release of Clang. And so we use GCC to compile Clang to allow us to leverage some of the more advanced techniques. So anyways, the gist is that, yes, we do, but that's pushed to the compile time now because we had to remove some of the optimizations on the code level. That's great. <clears throat> um, this idea of building the compiler uh, from scratch and then building Red Panda with that compiler leads into, well, to the next question, which is how, how do you go about testing the system and verifying that it it works as intended and it, it represents the Kafka API correctly, et cetera. Um, testing the system, that's another two hour talk. Let me try to summarize it. Um, so, so, man, there's so many. So we use uh, Jepson and so um, Dennis, who is also a collaborator of the HydroConf, he, he's a colleague of, of ours, he's fantastic. And he's actually extended the Jepson to have longer evaluation histories. So we do have empirical testing, uh, first of all, and, and uh, we're able to extend Jepson so that the evaluation time for um, correctness is linear instead of exponential with the default uh, Jepson evaluator by tweaking the, the model a little bit. So that's that's one. And so we, you know, emp empiricism for the win, we, we, we believe in, in Jepson for data safety, but there's all sorts of other testing, right? And so we have a lineage-based uh, fault injection based on the Mali paper from uh, Andy Pablo. Actually, sorry, uh, Peter Alvaro Noah, who's who's our EMC. He is uh, um, Peter Alvaro was his advisor. Uh, so, <laughs> so so Noah can actually uh, give give him in comments on this. Um, it's called uh, Honey Badger. It's part of the code, and you can inject the failure schedule. Uh, and then we have other things. Is because we're Kafka API compatible, then we just run open source tools. And then every time we see something that doesn't work on the on the parsing level, then we just kind of you know it's just a matter of whack a mole in uh, some of the bugs. But hopefully that just gives you an insight. I would say testing for us is very serious, and uh, you know it'll be a very long talk for me to give you all of the details. But hopefully that gives you guidance. Great, thank you. <clears throat> um, the next question is about tuning. So um, you know. Uh, you can imagine you're deploying this on all manners of hardware, right? I mean, like from disks now to NVMe and maybe tomorrow it's going to be persistent memory. How do you tune the system to adapt to these different, you know, ratios of latencies and capabilities? Yeah, where, where do, how, how to count the ways? So, um, you know, there's actually even more fundamental questions, which is actually if you're running on on on, uh, on Google, uh, how does it work with kernel settings that lie to you versus if you run it on Amazon? <laughs> actually, tuning is a really hard problem. So what do we do? Today, we have a program called RPK Auto-Tune. So RPK is the user interface. It's, it's just a little Go binary. And what it is, is it'll probe the hardware for the right capabilities. Uh, and, and so... You know, it, it's sort of the mentality. It's not. It's it's different from asking your compiler, "Hey, compiler, do you support this feature?" Rather than testing the functionality and saying, "Does the functionality work?" And so we err on the side of asking the hardware, "Does the functionality work?" So let me give you four or five guiding principles. So one of them is, 
does the NIC support multi-queue networking? And if so, you know, is it like truly multi-queue or is it like queue plus dispatch or is it single queue, right? And, and so we probe the hardware, we read what the hardware can tell us, and then we do. On the IO scheduling level, we, uh, uh, we run like a similar test to FIO, but that can propagate the latencies up to the user application and we measure, well, what is the latency at a, at a particular saturation? I think, it, and we call it, uh, you know, out of 500 microsecond latencies, what is the throughput that you can actually get on the device? And that gives us some calibration to start the hardware. Uh, on, you know, honestly, on the on the CPU level, we detect that you're running on, on Google, and then we disable some settings after we chatted with some of the kernel and the storage developers at, at uh, Google Cloud um, for, for some bugs that we found in, in the past. And so... Um, so, so that's so, so that's sort of the guiding principle is that we have to actually probe the hardware and and you can't uh, uh, rely on what the hardware tell you because Google will lie to you <laughs> in like on the VMs and and you're just like why is this thing so slow and why is my latency spiking and so it's really actually about testing the capabilities of the hardware and then because we don't use virtual memory and we can monitor some of the back pressure on the device itself. We are sort of, uh, you know, it, it's not future proof 100%, but, uh, you know, we, we can measure the actual latency coming from the device because we choose not to go through the kernel. And so that's another uh, big way of how do you go about um, building this, and, and hopefully that helps. Thank you very much. Uh, at what is uh, the most important things for me personally is that you mentioned that, uh, like, uh, something like, Testing is a topic for separated to our talk, correct? And I have yeah. one idea. I uh, have an idea for the next Hydra conference. Anyway, and gentlemen, thank you very much for the talk, Alex. It's uh, like amazing content. Noah, thank you very much for your support. And uh, I just to invite you both and all our audience to go to the Zoom discussion, to Zoom discussion uh that's uh, how to do it so you guys just have the link in your emails or telegram and all our like viewers uh, attendees can just push the web camera button just under the web player and join the zoom discussion uh like uh, right now so thank you thank you very much alex and nor and thank you for like for this talk bye bye Absolutely. Great to be here. Bye, everyone. See you soon. Yeah.